Take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 8. If you're not already there, and we'll be in Romans 8 in verse uh, 33 and 34 today. We're walking through Romans 8. We've been there this spring. And so it's easy to kind of lose the, the overall picture as we walk through week by week. And I know that happens. And so I, I want to remind you of what Paul's already said. In, in Romans 8, 1, the great declaration and promise is, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's a statement that Paul knows he has to back up. It's not just one of those things you can say and then walk on to other subjects. This is a huge statement. No condemnation for everyone who is in Christ Jesus. And so he spends the rest of the chapter really talking to us about that as he says that, that a sign of that is that the Spirit has been given to us and that it is by the Spirit that we are being sanctified as he continues to walk through. Yes, we have justification, but we also have sanctification as the Spirit of God kills the sin that still lies so close within us. The Spirit of God. <clears throat> it's not effort and willpower and discipline which kills sin. It's the Holy Spirit who kills sin. If we try to kill this sin by our flesh, then our flesh will only grow stronger. While some outward habits, Paul would teach us, might change, inwardly in our hearts, nothing changes. And so it becomes more deceptive, sin does, as we try to work on it ourselves, independent from God. Some of us, unfortunately, have the thought and can be guilty of is slipping into this thought, any of us, can slip into this thought, and maybe you have, even this week, as you think, like, you know, God saved me, and now I'm going to prove myself to God by being a good person that God loves. And when we get into that place, Christian, we are being independent, not God-dependent. The Holy Spirit keeps us God-dependent. It's through Him that we cry out, Abba, Father. We, We are brought into the family of adoption, through adoption, the blessing of adoption, where the Spirit of God says that we have a place at the table. And so we go to our dad with all of our life, not just little pieces of our life, not just the overwhelming things of life, but all of life, every detail, we take it to God. And then he goes into our future. And he begins to talk to us in verse 18 about this reality that the suffering that we experience in this present time as believers will continue. But if we add it all up, It's not worth comparing to the great weight of glory we will receive in the future. In that great future when God sets the the world free from the enslavement that it is now experiencing because of our sin. It's not worth comparing to the fact that one day we will be free of our sin fully and completely. And we who are right now moaning and crying out to God through many groans in the spirit... God, help us. God, how much longer, how much longer will I struggle with this sin of this life? As we see in the passage, well, there comes a day, he says, where all of that will be gone. There'll be no more struggle. There'll be no more war against sin. The reality is that Christ has won the war. And now every battle, we have the ability to be conquerors and even more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. What a beautiful passage this is in Romans 8 of encouragement of our hope, which is founded on Jesus Christ alone. And then, of course, we get into 28, which is where we'll pick up reading so we get the context of our passage today. He says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Our passage for today. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God 
who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Now let's continue to read for for the sake of context. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We come to the end of Romans 8, and we'll get there in a couple more weeks, but we we come to the end of Romans 8, and this is closing out all of the first eight chapters. Paul is really putting a punctuation point at the end of the eighth chapter by saying, we're about to transition, church. We're about to move to a new subject, church. But before we do, let's have one last song of victory. That's really what verses 31 through 39 are. They are Paul's song of victory, song of praise to Jesus Christ, the victor. Paul is convinced that this is the bedrock of our salvation that God justifies the ungodly through the power of Jesus Christ, the work of Jesus Christ, the life of Jesus Christ. And so he's punctuating the end of these first eight chapters as he prepares in verse 9 to shift a little. He's talked about the gospel. Now he wants to talk about what is the place of God's people, Israel, in God's salvation. That's where he's going to go in Romans 9. And I already told you, We're not going to go right into Romans 9, right? At the end of uh, this month, May the 28th, we're going to launch out into Psalms for a little while. And that's because we don't want you. We knew you would cancel your family vacations to be a part of our summer series in Romans 9. And we hated for you to lose all of your deposits. And so because of that, we moved it to the fall. In, in, uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to look at Psalm 1 and 2 and introduce a series on the Psalms. And then we're going to be there until August the 6th. And then August the 13th, we'll pick up in Romans 9. So he's bringing this to a climax. He's bringing it to an end. It's truly a song that we're reading here. A, a song of praise, a song of victory in Romans chapter 8. And we want to focus in on these two verses. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. And then he asks a repetitive question. One thing about a great teacher is he's repetitive, but he's repetitive with flavor. You know, he doesn't just say the same thing the same way every time, but the Apostle Paul knows the good teaching technique of asking interrogative questions. So he's acting like a lawyer, and he often asks the question, and then he asks it again, and then he'll ask it again, and he's hitting different aspects of the same Subject, that's exactly what he's done in 33 and 34. Who shall bring a charge, an accusation against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is it that shall condemn? Who is it? See, it's the same idea, this accusation. We're square in the middle of a passage here where Paul has taken us into the courtroom of God. Now, I don't know how many of you have visited a courtroom. If you've been on the defendant side, don't, don't admit it. Not here in church. Maybe some of you have served in jury duty. Maybe some of you always lie your way out of jury duty. But a courtroom is an intimidating place. There's one person in charge of the court. That person, the judge, can do whatever pleases them. If you don't believe it, Act up in court and watch what happens. Insist on your own way and watch what happens. The fact that that here in this section, this celebration, he brings us into the courtroom, it's designed to cause a little bit of of a tremble. When he asks the question, be honest with yourself, when he asks the question in verse 33, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? 
the first thing that your mind probably goes to is, like, <laughs> have you got time to listen to the list? Right? I mean, Paul, are you kidding me? My family hates me. They would bring charges against me. My coworkers, they would bring charges against me. My best friends, they've lived with me for so long. They know the wrong that I've done. My own conscience, Paul, would witness against me. It would condemn me. All of those things are true. God's law would condemn us. We know that. But I want you to notice what Paul does. He says, who shall bring? Not what shall bring. Who? And as I think about that, I want you to think about it. He's really narrowing down to one accuser. He's squaring up with one person, one individual accuser. You want to give a run at who that accuser might be? Satan himself. Who shall bring a charge against God's people, against his elect? Well, he's, he's, he's in Isaiah 50, verse 9, you see. The first, uh, the second of the, of the servant's uh, songs in Isaiah. In Isaiah 50 verse 9, the depiction is that the servant of God has charges brought against him to his face by the accuser. And so Paul is thinking about that. You know, you might can deal with your neighbor. You might can deal with your own conscience. You might can deal with your family. But there's a little bit of a, I mean, Satan, he's so strong. He's so powerful. He's so, he's so much greater than me. Paul wants us in the courtroom where our chief accuser has come. And he's standing. He accuses the brethren. That's his role in this life. Satan brings the charges before God against you and against me. Paul's probably also thinking in his mind, being the Old Testament scholar that he is, about Zechariah chapter 3. In Zechariah chapter 3, this is what is written. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, listen to this, clothed, in filthy garments. Joshua was a sinner. He was a high priest for Israel, but he was a sinner. And Satan has come into the courtroom of God and stands next to the angel of the Lord and says, look at his sin. Look how unkept he is. Look at his garments. What will Joshua do? He's undone. He's filthy. He's unacceptable. Look what it says. The angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you. And I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments and the angel of the Lord was standing by. Now, what we just read in Zechariah chapter 3 is what I think Paul is seeing in his mind's eyes. He thinks about the end of all things. Here's what you got to understand. Who is it that shall bring a condemnation, a charge against God's elect? Well, in this life, there's a lot of people lining up for that job. In this life, there's a lot of people that would like to condemn us. In this life, Satan loves to condemn us. But let me tell you what Paul's victorious speech is about is not about this life. It's about the life that's coming. When the angel of the Lord says, take off his filthy robes and put on the robes and the vestments that are pure. Wrap his head in the pure linen of the turban and let him stand before his God as a priest. Satan is ejected. From God's court. Oh, the accuser arrives to make his accusation. 
only to be told we've heard the final argument. Who will bring a charge against God's leg? God has given a verdict. Justified. Listen. In the days that are coming, when we meet the Lord at his throne, we won't have an accuser left to bring a charge against us because God will have banished him from the court. There's no need for the accusing attorney He's done away with, for God has pronounced a verdict, and that verdict is justified. God has justified him. You see, in previous chapters, in Romans chapter 3, for instance, it talks about the justification we receive from God through Jesus Christ. As he has propitiated our sins, we're able to be justified, made righteous in the sight of God. And in Romans chapter 5, He focuses on the fact that because we are justified, we have peace with God. But in Romans chapter 8, he goes from this moment to the moment of eternity when he says that justification has become glorification. He is fully justified. Who brings the charges against him in this day? The answer, no one. There's no one left. Our Savior has answered every charge. Charles Wesley understood this when he wrote the words to the great hymn about 200 years ago to And Can It Be. Listen to these words. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused him pain. For me who him to death pursued. Amazing love. How can it be that thou my God shouldst die for me? Tis misery all. The immortal dies. Who can explore his strange design? In vain the firstborn seraph tries. That's talking about Satan. uh, To sound the depths of love divine. Tis mercy all. Let earth adore. Let angel minds inquire no more. He, the Christ, left his father's throne above. So free, so infinite his grace. Emptied himself of all but love and bled For Adam's helpless race, tis mercy all, immense and free. For, oh my God, thou hast found me out. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flame with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Now that's a precious song to that point, but listen to the last verse, which is written based on our text. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him, my living head. And clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. There comes a day that we have coming to us through the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ where there will be no more condemnation. The the sentence of condemnation has been lifted in our day, but we still feel it. Don't you feel it? I mean, when you fail, you feel the guilt of that failure. You often feel the shame of that sin. And you feel the frustration of not being freed. And why is it that I keep going back to what I've already been told I'm free from? But what I'm telling you, what Paul is trying to encourage your hope with is, there comes a day... And it it will come to pass that the the one who would bring a charge against you is not admitted into God's court. He's come every day before then. Make no mistake about it. The charges come before the court on your behalf and my behalf regularly, I believe. Oh, look at that poor sinner. You saved Carlton? What a terrible sot he is. Look at his life. He's lazy. Don't you see him? He's not working hard enough for you. He doesn't deserve... We're going to get to what does battle against that in just a moment because there's a battle going on over over that. But the charges come day after day after day. But what Paul is pressing us to have hope in is the day when, when the accuser tries to enter the courtroom, the bailiff says, nope, the verdict has been given. Fully justified. No more charges admitted. No more hounding the believers with accusations. They are fully free. Who shall bring a charge? An accusation against God's elect? 
The answer, God justifies. But then he asked the question, who is condemned? How can God do this? Has God just decided to be like the eternal Santa Claus and say, well, you know, they're bad people, but we'll just forget it. We'll just wipe it off. We'll just act like it didn't happen. That would be a tenuous relationship to be in, wouldn't it? I mean, when someone tells you, when you, when you sin against your friend, maybe against your wife or your husband, and you go to them and confess your sin, and this is what they say. Please don't ever do this to a brother in Christ or sister in Christ. When they say, oh, just don't worry about it. it, it just don't, 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 no, that's okay. Just don't worry about it. That leaves an empty feeling, doesn't it? It's like, we walk away going, was that forgiveness or <laughs> probation or was it sincere? I mean, if you came before God's throne and he said, you know, you're an awful sinner, but just don't worry about it. Well, you'd spend the rest of eternity going, I wonder if he started worrying about it. Because if he starts worrying about it, I'm in trouble. But see, if we had no foundation to have this kind of confidence, then Paul knows we would have no confidence. We'd have a shallow confidence. We'd have a shaky confidence. We'd be prone to constantly worrying over our salvation, which he's trying to let us be free of in Romans chapter 8. He's trying to give us the great hope of our salvation. So what does he say? Who shall condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. God didn't say, oh, don't worry about your sin. God said, I'll deal with your sin. God said, I'll pay for the price of your sin. God said, I'll wash your sin clean. God said, I'll give you pure garments so you may stand in my presence. God said, I'll put you in my son, Jesus Christ, and I will see you as I see him. God hasn't said, don't worry about your sin. God said, I've dealt with your sin. I've finished your sin. I have accepted you on the basis of a righteousness not your own. This is the pure gospel. Christ died for us. Christ died for us. He came and he kept the law perfectly according to the old covenant, deserving all the blessings of the old covenant. Rather than taking his blessings, he took our cursing. And he hung on the tree suspended between God and man. And God poured his wrath out on the son. Isaiah 53 says he crushed him for our iniquities. The chastisement due for my sin was laid on him. God crushed the son so that he could have many sons and daughters. Who shall bring a charge against these that God has elected? God justified them. Oh, you mean he's like Santa Claus. He just said, yeah, just forget about it. It'll be all right. I mean, you're not, you don't measure up, but we'll accept you anyway. Oh, no. Who shall condemn? Christ Jesus has died. The bill of your freedom from your sin is signed with the blood of Jesus Christ. The eternal sacrifice that has continually washed you clean. Not only has he died... He died, but more than that, he has been raised. You see, if Jesus just died and went into the ground, then we might say, well, that was sad. We would feel like those who in his day saw him die, be placed in Joseph's tomb. We would go there and we would weep. Christianity would have a, one of the greatest pilgrimages of all time. God in the flesh, bones in the ground means that Christians by the millions and billions would journey there and kneel down in front of a tomb and weep and mourn and wonder, are we right with God or are we not? But we don't have a place to go. We have no pilgrimage to make because Jesus Christ pilgrimed from the eternal throne of glory to the dust and the man of dust, divine glory dust, Lived the life we couldn't live. Died the death we deserved to die. And that man of dust was raised from the ground on the third day. He died and he was raised. Oh, but Paul says there's more reason to glory than that and to be excited than that. He is at the right hand of God. He's at the right hand of God. 
He was raised from the dead, and 40 days later, he ascended to the right hand of God. Now, here, I want you to understand, this is not a statement of location, okay? Jesus hasn't been sitting down for 2,000 years. That's not what this means. That's not what this means. This means that he was elevated to the position of all sovereign and all powerful. He now is the power of God in the flesh. He's not sitting on a throne, literally. He is enthroned, but he's not sitting on the throne. He wears the garb of a priest before his father daily because he holds all authority in heaven and earth. So who brings a charge against one of his people? Who is it that's going to condemn? Christ died. Christ was raised. Christ ascended. And not only that, look at what it says at the end. Christ not only ascended, but what is he doing? I mentioned it just a minute ago. Who indeed is interceding for us. Now back in Romans chapter 8, we saw where the Spirit is interceding for us. And now we see that Christ is interceding for us. Remember, when we talked about the Spirit back in Romans 8, 26 and 27, we said that that interceding, that interceding was being done by the Spirit entering into our pain, lifting up our pain and carrying it to the throne. He feels what we feel. He, the, the groanings that he has are our groanings. He's groaning on our behalf as he takes our hurts and pains and sorrows before God the Father. That's not what Jesus is doing. Jesus is not entering into our pain. The Spirit enters into our pain. Jesus is like the high priest of the old covenant, carrying the prayers directly to the ear of the Father. You see, right now, Satan still brings charges against us in time. I believe that. He still likes to say, look how far they're falling short. And Jesus likes to say, look how much I've already done. We don't fear the charges of Satan. We don't deny them either. Listen, when your enemy comes to you and says, oh, you're guilty, tell him he just doesn't know how much guilt there is. But then quickly remind him, you don't know how great my Savior is. You don't know how deep the well of his love is. You can't understand or plumb the depths of his love and mercy and grace. You see, because Satan stands on the outside looking in, confused over how it is that God can love the people like you and me. Confused, angry, and trying to oppress you with his accusations. But Jesus is praying for you. Jesus is praying for you. This is the picture of Jesus as our high priest. Like it says in Hebrews chapter 4. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What we find is a great high priest who's wearing the priestly robes before the Father. If you think about, and maybe uh, you've forgotten this, in your study in the Old Testament or your reading of the Old Testament, I want to bring it back to your mind. The garments that the priests wore, I was reminded of that yesterday as I watched the coronation of a new king in England. You know, my forefathers died, so I wouldn't have to care about that. So I watched it without caring. (laughs) But I did watch it. Sadly, a church that no longer believes in the Bible spent a whole lot of time reading the Bible yesterday, which is a good thing. But they all wore these funny-looking clothes, if you watched it. All these robes. King Charles III put on the priestly robe, as it was called. It's, it's adorned after the robes that the priest of Israel would have worn. On that robe is a patch on each shoulder, which has six stones on each side. And on that On that robe of the priest were the 12 stones, the same stones on his chest. 
This was meant to, to symbolize the fact that the high priest, when he went in to pray before God, he carried the people with him. And they were never away from his heart. So when he went before God, he prayed for the people, carrying them to God and bearing them on his heart, the most core part of his being. And what I'm telling you is, and what this Bible verse is telling you, is that Jesus wears those garments as he intercedes for you at the right hand of God every moment of every day. So who is it that's going to condemn you? Who has a good charge to bring? Our high priest already knows our sins. He has succeeded where we have failed. And he carries us before the Father as he prays for us. Every time an accusation is raised, the voice of Jesus also raises to say, that one's mine. That one's mine. That one belongs to me. He has said in John chapter 10, the Father has given me those he had chosen into my hand and no one can take them from me. I have entrusted them to my Father. That's the part of intercession. He's entrusting them to the Father. And the Father is greater than all. And no one can take them from the Father's hand. That's the promise of Jesus Christ to us, Christian. Who brings the condemnation and the accusation? It really doesn't matter. He's not greater than Jesus. Jesus cannot be defeated. We have no condemnation now. Because we belong to him. Too many times... When we are assailed by our enemy or by our flesh, we turn back inside of ourselves to try to find some good thing that we have done. I want to warn you against that as I close. Listen, when you fall under the attack of the evil one, and it happens more than you think it does, when you fall under the attack of your conscience, when you fall under the attack of your close friends, your family, Yet you know that you have been forgiven of your sin and you are in Christ. Do not turn to yourself to find the solution to the attack. When Satan or your flesh or your conscience or those around you say you failed, don't get in an argument about how many times you succeeded. The truth is that if you fail once, you have failed always. So it's worthless. It's like taking a water hose to, a, to, a, to spray on a forest fire, and it does no good. Every time you spray the water, the fire flames higher. Every time you try to put Satan away in your own strength, he comes all that much more at you. Every time you try to quiet your conscience by reminding yourself that you read your Bible yesterday, you read, said your prayers yesterday, you were nice to your wife yesterday, not today, yesterday, you went to church last week, you were a good person at work, you didn't take things from the office you shouldn't take, you tried and worked diligently, you were kind to those you worked with, I did all these good things, all of that is undone with just simple ap- one accusation. Yeah, I know you did that yesterday, but today. You let that stray word come from your mouth, which came from a thought, which came from your heart. Are you really the Lord's? As long as you turn inward for righteousness, you will find nothing to stand on. But the moment the accusation is laid and you place your hand in the hand of Jesus Christ and you say, this is my surety. This is my pledge. I have failed every time. He has never failed failed. Now you will be delivered from your guilty conscience. Now you will be repelling Satan and all of his forces. Now you will be quieting the voices of those around you. Christians aren't those who depend on themselves to live a better life. They depend on the one who lived the best life. That's what this verse tells us. Who condemns us? As long as we stand in our own strength, everyone. But as long as we stand in Christ's strength, no one. For God is justified. God has justified us. Christ has been raised and is seated at the right hand and is interceding for us. Church, we have been set free. We sang it this morning um, as we sang before the throne of God above. I just want to remind you if I print it. Yeah, there they are. I just want to remind you of those great words. Listen to what he says. Behold him there. The risen lamb, 
my perfect, spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the king of glory and of grace, one with himself I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God. Church, we are set free. We have no fear of accusation or condemnation for Christ has justified us by his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and his intercession on our behalf. He will never fail no matter how many times you fail. This is the hope of the gospel. Let's pray together. Father.